Video 12 Teachings of Father Joe Cain The Power to Bless Part 3 I think that in the practical application of how to pray in the context of a healing mass in order to just flow with the sense of sacrifice and flow with the sense of Eucharist, I believe we may have to divide the talk in two. We'll be faithful to the group work, but maybe instead of having a playback from the group work, we'll just have a few norms of how to minister in the power of the Eucharist. How does that sound? Uh, <clears throat> How do you feel about where we've gone so far? Do you feel at, at home with that? Is there any area of confusion or lack of clarity? <laughs> Thank you. Now, where does our sacrifice come in? Do we just ride in the boat as uh, passengers? We don't have to row, we don't have to trim the sail, we don't have to clean the deck or anything. Are we just riding along on the wave of what Christ did? There's something very interesting and very powerful in that text of Hebrews, and we'll go back to it again. Although he was a son, he learned to obey through suffering. Can you imagine that Christ learned to obey through suffering? It almost blows your mind, doesn't it? almost blows your mind, but Christ learned to obey through suffering. So suffering seems to be something very, very essential, something very, very native to the whole sense of our relationship with God. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. There's a mystery there, thank you, that our Lord was called upon to perform the will of the Lord. He was called upon to offer a sacrifice with things very symbolical of the Old Testament. We saw that there was an altar sanctified. We saw that there were gifts on the altar. What were the gifts? Who's got a good memory? They were placed on the altar. There was the sacrifice of the Lamb. And then there were the dry sacrifices, flour, which represented and is turned into the bread of the offering. So there we have the symbolism and the elements of the Eucharist. But it also says, and if I can find it, I'll repeat it. We uh, want to pick it up where we left off on the other side uh, by referring back to the uh, text of Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 10, but especially in verses 7 to 8, where it speaks of our Lord offering prayers and entreaties in silence and in tears to him who had the power to save. And there's sort of a mystery there because it represents our Lord actually bringing the personal dimension, not only being a sacrifice in the objective sense, but bringing his whole heart to it. So uh, we were talking about it in the first group over here, about the fact that the Eucharist uh, does require something on our part, especially in the line of reconciliation. 
And that verse that says, that is why some of you are sick and some of you have died. Some uh, versions say have fallen asleep, which is the same. Then it went a little bit into that of, uh, well, how worthy are we of communion, or do some people actually go to communion without being worthy? And uh, it brings out also the question of routine. There seemed to be a little preoccupation about going to Mass every day. It gets sort of routine, and you perhaps get so used to the mystery that it ceases to be mystery. But I think the Lord can handle that better than uh, the fact that if not going to the Eucharist at all. Then uh, there was a question about uh, what that meant when St. Paul was speaking about that, about the uh, not, being, not being in the right attitudes. Somebody quoted Father Duffy as having said that that referred to confession and so forth. But here, for the moment, I think we're going to zero in on this. Not the fact of who's worthy or who's not worthy, in the sense of sin, because we might get judgmental about it, and uh, I don't think that would lead to much, but rather thinking of the tremendous power, perhaps, that we haven't explored yet, of coming to that unity which is health-giving, which really gives life to the participants. And our Lord said that when he was discussing with the Pharisees. He said, as I draw life from the living Father, in the same way, he who eats of this sacrament will draw life from me. And uh, I have participated in some Eucharists where people had come together in such unity and such love and such reconciliation that you could feel that life flowing from the Eucharist. I'd like to give one example that happened down in Chile. <coughs> it was just after the terrible happenings, after September the 11th of uh, 1972, when there was the coup, the military coup, where thousands of people lost their lives, many people disappeared. There was tremendous tensions in families for the loss of members of families, looking for members of the families, people in jail. And so there was tremendous healing went on when we got to the Eucharist, and we prepared one special Eucharist in view of that, in view of healing. And there was a lady came up before Mass, oh, Father, I have this problem, could you pray for me? And so putting it in the context of the Eucharist, I said, we're going to have a special prayer after communion because communion is the most healing thing we can receive. So perhaps we'll pray for you then. So after communion, we went into a general prayer. And then I thought I'd better keep my promise. So I went over and prayed for this lady, only to find out afterwards I made a mistake. It wasn't her at all. It wasn't the same one. The next evening, which was Friday, this uh, lady after the communion and the mass asked to give a little testimony. And she stood there with tears streaming down her face. She was the one I prayed for by mistake. And she said, the doctors told me that I would never walk again, never be able to do my work. She said, some time ago, I started the novena to the Blessed Virgin. Her, apparently she had some kind of infection of the bone that had eaten out the bones. And she said, Blessed Virgin, I only ask that I can get to my feet and at least serve my family by cooking. And she succeeded in doing that, but with great pain and difficulty. And she said, since the prayer after communion yesterday, she said, today I couldn't find a chair because it was so crowded. I was standing all during the Mass with no pain, no discomfiture, whatever. And today I could do all sorts of things that I couldn't do before. The power of prayer in the Eucharist. So that opened up a whole avenue of exploration. Where does the power come from in the Eucharist? I explored it with a couple of doctors because I think we need to bring in the human dimension. And one of them was a very beautiful doctor by the name of Evelis from Puerto Rico, San Juan. She was so young she looked like a college girl, but was a very competent doctor. And she was telling about how she prayed for her patients, mostly a lot of them cancer patients, some of them terminal. So I said, I'd like to accompany you, could I? She said, sure, anytime. So I went to the hospital with her. And as she went from patient to patient visiting, partly as a doctor, partly as a friend, and partly as a prayer person, it was really a teaching, first of all, the spontaneity of these people, where they could move through the professionality without any shame into the prayer dimension. So we prayed for each patient, and I listened to her praying. And her prayer followed the physical symptoms and followed her knowledge of the person. It was detailed. It was personal. 
And I thought to myself, that was the way Jesus prayed. He had a specific prayer for the specific need of each person. So I said to Evelise, wouldn't it be wonderful if at the end of the conference we could have a mass, a healing mass, and if you could explain what happens in the body through the power of the blood. And at first she said, oh no, you do it, I, I, I couldn't. And I said, oh, you're in your field. You're the one that's indicated because you're the one that's sensitized to pain and you're the one that knows what happens in this field. The Lord will use you as a channel. So after the gospel, she got up and just as a doctor explained what happens through the power of the blood within the body. And when she finished, you had the feeling that every cell in the body contributes in some way to every other cell. Very simple example, the lungs supply oxygen, the stomach processes the food, the intestines filter it, and so forth. The red blood corpuscles provide uh, vitality and, and the, red, uh, the white blood corpuscles defend against enemies. And you could go on and on. And very interestingly, in Mexico, there was a Dr. Donato who has had tremendous success in ca with cancer patients because of the discovery that the cancer cells multiply and proliferate because the cancer has some uh, type of protection which defends it against the healing processes of the body. The cancer is a part of human tissue that becomes a law unto itself, receives but doesn't give, and therefore cuts itself also off from the healing process. And so he uh, in, uh, got together a process, I wouldn't even attempt to describe it, to break down the resistance of the cancerous cells to, or the cancerous uh, tissues to uh, the resistance to the healing powers of the body with tremendous results. So if we start to apply that and think of the blood of Christ coming into us as a body, not only as one personal physical body, but as the whole body of Christ, then every cell at that mo moment should be a life-giving cell to others. But just as Ebelise brought a certain gift and a certain prayer power because of her contribution as a doctor, her professionality, in the same way, each one, through the special gifts that he has, will bring to the Mass a special power and a special healing. Uh, I won't go to the texts, I'll just refer to them because we don't have time, but there are some very powerful things that come out in this. First of all, reconciliation we find the greatest obstacle to the healing power of Jesus, whether in the Eucharist or in any other prayer situation, is a lack of reconciliation, any resentment, any negative feeling. And so our Lord said, if you are going to present your gift at the altar and see how the sacrifice is related to prayer, always sacrifice, then prayer. Go first, be reconciled with your brother, then come offer your gift, then we can talk, which is prayer. So we had a group of about 30 ministers of the Eucharist in a parish in Comus where we had something like 50,000 people within the parish limits and three priests ministering directly to the parish. I was working on a special training program, training of lay people for ministry. So these ministers of the Eucharist met every week, shared among themselves, had a prayer meeting, and had also a teaching dimension. And then they went out and they visited the sick and the shut-in and got to people that we couldn't get to at all. And one of them brought up the problem. Father, what do we do when somebody says, I need to get to confession, I need to be reconciled, and we know that there's no priest available at that time and may not be for some time. What do we do? What could you do? That's right. We can call on the power of the blood of Christ. Do we have to give sacramental confession as such? No. There is the power within that community which lives under the power of the blood of Christ to communicate the power of the blood of Christ in love. And I suggested taking simple texts. Has anyone condemned you? No, Lord. Therefore, neither do I. Go and sin no more. God so loved the world that he sent his only Son into the world so that anyone who believes in him may not perish but may have life eternal. There are any number of texts, but basically it's the same principle. We have become part of the royal priesthood of Christ by our being baptized into Christ, and therefore we have been placed on the altar in baptism, in a sense. Therefore that power flows through us, through every cell of the body. And it was just marvelous what some of those people did in reconciling. But there was another dimension. 
And when we talked about some people being away from the church for years, and when we discussed it, we found that very often that alienation came from a hurt, either from the priest, from the community, from the church. It didn't matter from where. But we found that the loving community was very instrumental in speaking love and acceptance to that person to overcome the alienation. And very often, when that person was accepted by the loving, believing, acting community, then they were open to go back to confession and the sacraments without any resistance. And so again, the common priesthood. You are exercising your priesthood when you reach out in love to overcome alienation so that that person then can move back without difficulty into the sacramental current of the church, even if there isn't a possibility of getting to the ministerial sacrament. Isn't that marvelous? There are many opportunities when you can use that. Parents with their children, husband and wives. Like one priest said when somebody said, I came and... <coughs> I had, a, I had a spat with my wife. Well, are you sorry for it? Well, tell her. Then, then you tell the Lord. Because the, the husband and wife are ministers of sacrament to each other. The matrimony is an ongoing sacrament, which is also a reconciling sacrament. And so, for the, therefore, the first sacerdotal ministry is between husband and wife in reconciliation. And then it comes to the church and is integrated into the larger body. What are some of the other applications we could make of how the body brings the power of healing in the Eucharist and the sacrament to bear to each member? 